From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday evening session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by a choir comprised of children and youth who reside in the South Jordan, Utah area. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs> President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you most warmly to the Saturday evening session of the 192nd Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We welcome all who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be by a choir comprised of children and youth who reside in the South Jordan, Utah area under the direction of Allison Unsworth with Linda Margots and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Come Rejoice. The invocation will then be offered by Matthias Held of the 70, after which the choir will sing, I know that my Redeemer loves me.
Our dear and kind Heavenly Father, in gratitude, we bow our heads before Thee this afternoon. We thank Thee for Thy Son, Jesus Christ, for Thy restored gospel, and that we have a living prophet today. We thank Thee, Father in heaven, for the many blessings that we receive in our lives. We thank Thee for the inspired messages that we have been hearing and that we will be hearing in these meetings. We thank Thee, Father in heaven, for, the, for our families and for all the members all over the world who are participating. Father in heaven, we ask for a special blessing upon all those brothers and sisters who are in distress, who are uh, suffering under any kind of afflictions or difficulties of wars or health challenges. May Thou give us them strength and comfort and let them know that Thou lovest them. We are asking now also for Thy inspiration upon all those that are listening to, this, to the words and to the messages presented here, that they might have answers to the questions in their hearts, that they feel the love of Thee and of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. And we say these things in His name, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Bishop Gerald Cosse, presiding bishop of the Church. He will be followed by Sister Michelle D. Craig, who serves as first counselor in the Young Women General Presidency. Elder Kevin W. Pearson of the Seventy will then address us. Bishop Cosse. While visiting our native country of France, my wife and I recently had the pleasure of taking a few of our grandchildren to explore a magnificent garden situated in the little town of Giverny. We enjoyed wandering along its paths to admire the beautiful flower beds, the elegant water lilies, and the light playing on the ponds. This amazing place is the result of the creative passion of one man, the great painter Claude Monet who for 40 years tenderly shaped and cultivated his garden to make it his painting workspace. Monet immersed himself in nature's splendor, then with his paintbrush he conveyed the impressions he felt with strokes of color and light. Over the years he created an extraordinary collection of hundreds of paintings directly inspired by his garden. Brothers and sisters, our interactions with the beauties of nature around us can produce some of the most inspiring and delightful experiences in life. The emotions we feel kindle within us a deep sense of gratitude for our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, who created this magnificent earth with its mountains and streams, plants and animals, and our first parents, Adam and Eve. The work of creation is not an end in itself. It is an integral part of God's plan for His children. Its purpose is to provide a setting in which men and women may be tested, exercise their agency, find joy and learn and progress so that they may one day return to the presence of their Creator and inherit eternal life. These wonderful creations were prepared entirely for our benefit and are living proof of the love the Creator has for His children. The Lord declared, Yea, all things which come of the earth are made for the benefit and the use of man, both to please the eye and to gladden the heart. However, the divine gift of creation does not come without duties and responsibilities these duties are best described by the concept of stewardship. In gospel terms, the word stewardship designates a sacred, spiritual, or temporal responsibility to take care of something that belongs to God for which we are accountable. As taught in the Holy Scriptures, our earthly stewardship includes the following principles. First principle. The entire earth, including all life thereon, belongs to God. The Creator has entrusted the earth's resources and all forms of life to our care, but He retains full ownership. He said, I, the Lord, stretch out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine. All that is on the earth belongs to God, including our families, our physical bodies, and even our very lives. Second principle, as towards of God's creations, we have a duty to honor and care for them. As God's children, we have received a charge to be stewards, caretakers, and guardians of His divine creations. The Lord said that He made every man accountable as a steward of our earthly blessings which I have made and prepared for my creatures. Our Heavenly Father allows us to use earthly resources according to our own free will. Yet, our agency should not be interpreted as license to use or consume the riches of this world without wisdom or restraint. The Lord gave this admonition, and it pleases God that He hath given all these things unto man for unto this end were they made to be used with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. 
President Russell M. Nelson once remarked, quote, as beneficiaries of the divine creation, what shall we do? We should care for the earth, be wise towards over it, and preserve it for future generations, close quote. Beyond being simply a scientific or political necessity, the care of the earth and of our natural environment is a sacred responsibility entrusted to us by God, which should fill us with a deep sense of duty and humility. It is also an integral component of our discipleship. How can we honor and love Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ without honoring and loving their creations? There are many things that we can do, collectively and individually, to be good stewards. Considering our individual circumstances, each of us can use the bountiful resources of the earth more reverently and prudently. We can support community efforts to care for the earth. We can adopt personal lifestyles and behaviors that respect God's creations and make our own living spaces tidier, more beautiful, and more inspirational. Our stewardship over God's creations also includes, at its pinnacle, a sacred duty to love, respect, and care for all human beings with whom we share the earth. They are sons and daughters of God, our sisters and our brothers, and their eternal happiness is the very purpose of the work of creation. The author Antoine de Saint-Exupéry recounted the following. One day, while traveling on a train, he found himself sitting amidst a group of refugees. Deeply moved by the hopelessness he saw in the face of a young child, he exclaimed, when by mutation a new rose is born in the garden, all the gardeners rejoice. They isolate the rose, tend it, foster it. But there is no gardener for man. My brothers and sisters, should we not be the gardeners for our fellow men and women? Are we not our brother's keeper? Jesus commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. From his mouth, the word neighbor does not merely mean geographic proximity. It implies the proximity of the heart. It encompasses all the inhabitants of this planet, whether they live near us or in a faraway country, regardless of their origins, personal backgrounds, or circumstances. As disciples of Christ, we have a solemn duty to work tirelessly for peace and harmony among all nations of the earth. We must do our very best to protect and bring solace and relief to the weak, the needy, and all those who suffer or who are oppressed. Above all, the greatest gift of love we can offer our fellow men is to share with them the joy of the gospel and invite them to come and to their Savior through sacred covenants and ordinances. Third principle, we are invited to participate in the work of creation. The divine process of creation is not yet complete. Every day, God's creations continue to grow, expand, and multiply. The most wonderful thing is that our Heavenly Father extends to us an invitation to participate in His creative work. We participate in the work of creation whenever we cultivate the earth or add our own constructions to this world, as long as we show respect for God's creations. Our contributions may be expressed through the creation of works of art, architecture, music, literature, and culture, which embellish our planet, quicken our senses, and brighten our lives. We also contribute through scientific and medical discoveries that preserve the earth and life upon it. President Thomas S. Monson summarized this concept with his beautiful words, quote, God left the world and finished for man to work his skill upon, that man might know the joys and glories of creation." Close quote. In Jesus' parable of the talents, when the master returned from his journey, he praised and rewarded the two servants who grew and magnified their talents. In contrast, he called a servant who hid his unique talent in the earth and profitable, and he took away even that which he had received. 
Similarly, our role as towards of earthly creations is not solely about conserving or preserving them. The Lord expects us to work diligently as moved upon by His Holy Spirit to grow, enhance, and improve upon the resources He has entrusted to us, not for our benefit only, but to bless others. Among all of man's achievements, none can equal the experience of becoming co-creators with God in giving life or in helping a child learn, grow, and thrive, whether it be as parents, teachers, leaders, or in any other role. There is no stewardship more sacred, more fulfilling, and also more demanding than that of partnering with our Creator in providing physical bodies for His spirit children and then helping them reach their divine potential. The responsibility of co-creation serves as a constant reminder that life and each person's body are sacred, that they belong to none other than God, and that He has made us guardians to respect, protect, and care for them. The commandments of God, which govern the powers of procreation and the establishment of eternal families, guide us in this holy stewardship, which is so crucial to His plan. My brothers and sisters, we should recognize that all is spiritual to the Lord, including the most temporal aspects of our lives. I testify that great spiritual blessings are promised to those who love and care for the earth and their fellow men and women. As you stay faithful in this sacred stewardship and honor your eternal covenants, you will grow in the knowledge of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, and you will feel their love and their influence more abundantly in your life. All this will prepare you to dwell with them and receive additional creative power in the life to come. At the end of, his, of this mortal existence, the Master will ask us to give an account for sacred stewardship, including how we have cared for His creations. I pray that we will then hear His loving words whispered to our hearts. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Sometimes it helps to know what to expect. Near the end of his ministry, Jesus told his apostles that hard times would come. But he also said, See that ye be not troubled. Yes, he would leave them, but he would not leave them alone. He would send his Spirit to help them remember, stand fast, and find peace. The Savior fulfills his promise to be with us, his disciples. But we must continually look to him and help us recognize and enjoy His presence. Christ's disciples have always encountered hard times. A dear friend of mine sent me an old article from the Nebraska Advertiser, a Midwestern United States newspaper dated July 9, 1857. It read, This morning early, a company of Mormons passed through on their journey to Salt Lake. Women, not very delicate to be sure, dragging handcarts like beasts. One woman tumbled down in this black mud, which caused a slight halt in the procession. Little children trudged alongside in their strange foreign dress, looking as determined as their mothers. I've thought a lot about this mud-drenched woman. Why was she pulling alone? Was she a single mother? What gave her the inner strength, the grit, the perseverance, to make such a wrenching journey through mud, pulling all her possessions in a handcart to an unknown desert home, at times being mocked by observers. President Joseph F. Smith spoke of the inner strength of these pioneer women, saying, Could you turn one of these women away from their convictions in The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Could you darken their minds as to the mission of the Prophet Joseph Smith? Could you blind them with reference to the divine mission of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? No, never in the world could you do it. 
Why? Because they knew it. God revealed it to them, and they understood it. And no power on earth could turn them from what they knew to be that truth. Brothers and sisters, to be such men and women is the call of our day. Disciples who dig deep to find the strength to keep pulling when called to walk through wilderness. Disciples with convictions that have been revealed to us by God. Followers of Jesus who are joyful and wholehearted in our personal journey of discipleship. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we believe and can grow in three important truths. First, we can keep our covenants even when it's not easy. When your faith, your family, or your future are challenged, when you wonder why life is so hard when you're doing your best to live the gospel, remember that the Lord told us to expect troubles. Troubles are part of the plan and do not mean that you've been abandoned. They are part of what it means to be His. He was, after all, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I am learning that Heavenly Father is more interested in my growth as a disciple of Jesus Christ than He is with my comfort. I may not always want it to be that way, but it is. Living in convenience does not bring power. The power we need to withstand the heat of our day is the Lord's power, and His power flows through our covenants with Him. To lean in with our faith when facing strong headwinds, to sincerely strive each day to do what we covenanted with the Savior we would do, even and especially when we're tired, worried, and wrestling with troubling questions and issues, is to gradually receive His light, His strength, His love, His Spirit, His peace. The point of walking the covenant path is to approach the Savior. He is the point, not our perfect progress. It is not a race, and we must not compare our journey to others. Even when we stumble, He is there. Second, we can act in faith. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we understand that faith in Him requires action, especially in hard times. Many years ago, my parents decided to re-carpet the house. The night before the new carpet arrived, my mom asked my brothers to remove furniture and rip out bedroom carpet so the new carpet could be installed. My then seven-year-old sister Emily was already asleep. So while she slept, they quietly removed all the furniture from her room except the bed, and then they tore out the carpet. Well, like older brothers sometimes do, they decided to pull a prank. They removed the rest of her belongings from the closet and off the walls, leaving the room bare. Then they wrote a note and tacked it to the wall. Dear Emily, we moved. <laughs> we'll write in a few days and tell you where we are. Love your family. Well, the next morning, when Emily did not come for breakfast, my brothers went to find her. There she was, sad and alone behind a closed door. Emily reflected on this experience later. I was crushed, but what would have happened if I had just opened the door? What would I have heard? What would I have smelled? I would have known I was not alone. I would have known I was really loved. The thought never even crossed my mind to do something about my situation. I just gave up and stayed in my closet crying. And yet, if I had simply opened the door. My sister made an assumption based on what she saw, but it wasn't a reflection of the way things actually were. Isn't it interesting that we, like Emily, can become so weighed down in sadness or hurt or discouragement or worry or loneliness or anger or frustration that it doesn't even occur to us to simply do something, to open the door to act with faith in Jesus Christ? 
The scriptures are filled with examples of men and women, disciples of Christ, who, when facing the impossible, simply acted, who got up in faith and walked. To lepers who sought healing, Christ said, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. They went to show themselves to the priests as if they had already been healed. And in the process of acting, they were. I also want to say that if the thought of taking action amid your pain feels impossible, please let your action be to reach out for help to a friend, a family member, a church leader, a professional. This can be a first step to hope. Third, we can be wholehearted and joyful in our devotion. When hard times come, I try to remember that I chose to follow Christ before I came to earth and that, my cha and that challenges to my faith, my health, and my endurance are all part of the reason I'm here. And I certainly should never think that today's trial calls into question God's love for me or let it turn my faith in Him into doubt. Trials do not mean that the plan is failing. They are part of the plan meant to help me seek God. I become more like Him when I endure patiently and hopefully like Him when in agony I pray more earnestly. Jesus Christ was the perfect example of loving our Father with all His heart, of doing His will regardless of the cost. I want to follow His example by doing the same. I am inspired by the wholehearted, whole-souled discipleship of the widow who threw her two mites into the temple treasury. She gave her all. Jesus Christ recognized the abundance of her all, where others saw only her lack. The same is true with each of us. He doesn't see our lack as failure, but rather as an opportunity to exercise faith and to grow. My fellow disciples of Jesus Christ, with all my heart, I choose to stand with the Lord. I choose to stand with His chosen servants, President Russell M. Nelson and his fellow apostles, for they speak for him and are the stewards of the ordinances and covenants that tie me to the Savior. When I stumble, I will keep getting up, relying on the grace and enabling power of Jesus Christ. I will stay in my covenant with him and work through my questions by study of God's word, by faith, and with the help of the Holy Ghost, whose guidance I trust. I will seek His Spirit every day by doing the small and simple things. This is my path of discipleship. And until the day that the everyday wounds of mortality are healed, I will wait upon the Lord and trust Him, His timing, His wisdom, His plan. Arm in arm with you, I want to stand with Him forever, wholehearted, knowing that when we love Jesus Christ with all our hearts, He gives us all in return. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. One Sunday, while preparing to partake of the sacrament after several weeks of state conference assignments, an interesting and powerful thought passed through my mind. As the priest began offering the blessing on the bread, words I had heard so many times before pressed forcefully upon my mind and heart. And witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son and always remember him and keep his commandments which he has given them that they may always have His Spirit to be with them. How many times have we witnessed unto God that we are willing? As I pondered the significance of those sacred words, the word willing impressed me as never before. 
A flood of sweet and sacred experiences filled my mind and heart with love and gratitude for the atoning sacrifice of the Savior and his crucial role in the Father's plan of redemption for my family and me. Then I heard and felt the penetrating words of the prayer on the water, that they may witness unto thee that they do always remember him. I understood clearly in that moment that keeping my covenants must be more than good intentions. Partaking of the sacrament is not a passive religious ritual implying our mere consent. It is a powerful reminder of the reality of the Savior's infinite atonement and the need to always remember Him and keep His commandments. Willingness to focus on the Savior is so crucial, it is the central message of the two most quoted scriptures in the Church, the sacrament prayers. Understanding the truth of what Heavenly Father so willingly offers each of us through His only begotten Son should evoke our utmost efforts to always be willing in return. Is our own spiritual foundation built solidly on Jesus Christ? If our spiritual foundation is shallow or superficial, we might be inclined to base our willingness on a social cost-benefit analysis or a personal inconvenience index. And if we embrace the narrative that the Church consists primarily of outdated or politically incorrect social policies, unrealistic personal restrictions, and time commitments, then our conclusions about willingness will be flawed. We should not expect the principle of willingness to trend positively with social media influencers or TikTok enthusiasts. The precepts of men rarely align with divine truth. The Church is a gathering place for imperfect individuals who love God and who are willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That willingness is rooted in the reality that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. This divine truth can only be known by the power of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, our willingness is directly proportionate to the amount of time we commit to be in holy places where the influence of the Holy Ghost is present. We would do well to spend more time in meaningful conversation discussing our concerns with a, lovely, uh, with a loving Father in Heaven and less time seeking the opinions of other voices. We could also choose to change our daily news feed to the words of Christ in the Holy Scriptures and to prophetic words from His holy living prophets. The importance we place on our Sabbath day observance, paying an honest tithe, holding a current temple recommend, attending the temple, and honoring our sacred temple covenants are all powerful indicators of our willingness and evidence of our commitment. Are we willing to put forth more than a superficial effort into strengthening our faith in Christ? Heavenly Father loves us perfectly, but that love comes with great expectations. He expects us to willingly place the Savior at the very center of our lives. The Savior is our perfect example of willingness to submit to the Father in all things. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He willingly atoned for our sins. He willingly eases our burdens, calms our fears, gives us strength, and brings peace and understanding to our hearts in times of distress and grief. Yet, faith in Jesus Christ is a choice. If we can no more than desire to believe in His words, we have a starting point to begin or to reset our journey of faith. His, his words, if planted in our hearts like a seed and nourished with great care, will take root and our faith will grow into assurance and become a principle of action and power. The Book of Mormon is our most powerful resource for growing and restoring our faith. Willingness is the catalyst of faith. Mortality by divine design is not easy and at times can be overwhelming. However, we are that we might have joy. Focusing on the Savior in our covenants brings lasting joy. The purpose of mortality is to prove our willingness, 
The great task of life and the cost of discipleship is to learn the will of the Lord and then to do it. True discipleship leads to a fullness of joy. Are we willing to pay the price of discipleship? The covenant path is not a simple checklist. It is a process of spiritual growth and deepening commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. The central purpose of every commandment, principle, covenant, and ordinance is to build faith and trust in Christ. Our determination to center our lives on Christ, therefore, must be consistent, not conditional, situational, or superficial. We cannot afford to take vacation days or personal time off from our willingness to stand as witnesses of God in all times and in all things and in all places. Discipleship is not cheap because the companionship of the Holy Ghost is priceless. Surely the Lord was thinking of our day as he taught the parable of the ten virgins. Of the five who were wise, he said, they have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived, while the lamps of the foolish are gone out for lack of oil. Perhaps the word of Nephi best, words, of, words of Nephi best describe these once faithful members of the church, and others he will pacify and lull them away into carnal security that they will say, all is well in Zion. Carnal security is seeking for and trusting in worldly things instead of Christ. In other words, looking through a secular lens instead of a spiritual lens. The Holy Ghost gives us the capacity to see things as they really are and as they really will be. Only by the power of the Holy Ghost can we know the truth of all things and be not deceived. We place Christ at the center of our lives and pledge our willingness to obey his commandments, not because we are blind, but because we can see. What about the foolish virgins? Why were they unwilling to carry a vessel of spiritual oil? Did they simply procrastinate? They were perhaps too casual because it was inconvenient or seemed unnecessary. Whatever the reason, they were deceived about the crucial role of Christ. This is Satan's fundamental deception and why their lamps of testimony eventually went out for lack of spiritual oil. This parable is a metaphor for our time. Many leave the Savior and their covenants long before they leave his church. We live in unprecedented times, long foretold by ancient prophets, a day when Satan rages in the hearts of the children of men and stirs them up to anger against that which is good. Far too many of us live in a virtual world awash in entertainment and messaging hostile to divine identity and belief in Christ. The most powerful spiritual influence in the life of a child is the righteous example of loving parents and grandparents who faithfully keep their own sacred covenants. Intentional parents teach their children faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that they too may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Casual and inconsistent covenant keeping leads to spiritual casualty. The spiritual damage is often greatest on our children and grandchildren. Parents and grandparents, are we still willing? President Nelson has warned that in coming days it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. This is a clear and unmistakable warning to trim our lamps and increase our spiritual oil reserves. Are we still willing to follow the living prophets? What is the level of spiritual oil in your lamp? What changes in your personal life would enable you to have the influence of the Holy Ghost more constantly? Today, as in the times of Jesus, there will be those who will turn back, unwilling to accept the price of discipleship. As harsh and hateful criticism is increasingly leveled at the Savior's church and those who follow him, our discipleship will require a greater willingness to straighten and strengthen our spiritual spines and heed them not. 
if our spiritual foundation is built solidly on Jesus Christ, we will not fall and we need not fear. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. May we always be willing in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As directed, the congregation will join the choir in singing Redeemer of Israel. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Danielson Silva of the 70, Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will then be our concluding speaker for this session. Following Elder Anderson's remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, O Thou Rock of Our Salvation. The benediction will then be offered by President Susan H. Porter, who serves as primary general president. This is the Saturday evening session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In 1982, I was finishing my, my associate degree in topography at a technical school. At the end of the year, a classmate invited me to have a conversation. I remember that we left the other members of the class and went to an area beside the sport courts. When we got there, he spoke to me about his religious convictions. And not only did he show me a book, but he gave me the book. Honestly, I do not remember all the words that he said, but I remember that moment very well and the way I felt 
when he said, I want to bear my testimony to you that this book is true and that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored. After our conversation, I went home, turned a few pages in the book and placed it on a shelf because we were at the end of the year and it was my last year of my topography degree, I did not really pay much attention to the book, nor to my classmate who had shared it with me. The name of the book, you can already guess. Yes, it was the Book of Mormon. Five months later, the missionaries came into my house. They were leaving just as I was coming, from, coming home from work. I invite them back in. We sat down in the little pat patio in front of my house. In my search, they taught, and they taught me. In my search for the truth, I asked them which church was true and how I could find it. The missionaries taught me that I could obtain that answer for myself. With great expectation and desire, I accept the challenge to read several chapters from the Book of Mormon. I prayed with a sincere heart and with real intent. The answer to my question was clear. And several, several days later, more precisely, on May 1st, 1983, I was baptized and confirmed a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today, when I think about the sequence of events that occurred, I see clearly how important the courage of my classmate was when he bore his testimony about the historic truth and presented me with a tangible proof of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even the Book of Mormon. That simple act, but of profound significance to me, created a connection between me and the missionaries when I met them. The truth had been presented to me, and after my baptism, I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. During the following years, and with the help of very special people such as leaders, teachers, friends, and also through my own personal study, I learned that when I decided to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I had accepted the task of not only defending the truth, but also to proclaim it. When we agree to believe in the truth, to follow it, and when we make an effort to become true disciples of Jesus Christ, we do not receive a certificate with a guarantee that we will not make mistakes, that we will not be tempted to walk away from the truth, that we will not be criticized, or even that we will not experience afflictions. But the knowledge of the truth teaches us that when we enter the straight and narrow path, that will take us back to the presence of the Heavenly Father, there will always be a way to escape these problems. There will always be the possibility of doubting our doubts before doubting our faith. And finally, we have a guarantee that we will never be alone when we go through afflictions, for God visits his people in the midst of the afflictions. Once we learn the truth, the Lord gives us the opportunity to do what he would do if he were here today. Truly, he shows us by his teachings that we must do. And he shall go forth in the power of my spirit, preaching my gospel two by two in my name, lifting up your voices as with the sound of a trump, declaring my word unto angels of God. The opportunity for missionary service in our youth is unique. Please, young men, do not postpone your preparation to serve the Lord as missionaries. As you face situations that may make the decision to serve a mission a difficult one, such as interrupting your study for a time, saying goodbye to your girlfriend without any guarantee that you will ever date her again, or even having to walk away from a job, remember the Savior's example. During his ministry, he likewise faced difficult, including criticism, persecution, and ultimately the bitter cup 
of his atoning sacrifice. Yet, in all circumstances, he sought to do the will of his father and give glory to him. Young women, you are very welcome. If you so desire to work in the vineyard of the Lord, and as you prepare yourselves to serve as full-time missionaries, you will not be exempted from the same challenges. To all who decided to serve him, I promise you that the 24 or 18 months of services will pass in the mission field just as they would pass if you stayed home. But the opportunities that await the worthy, worthy young men and young women, women of this church in the mission field are unique. The privilege of representing the Savior Jesus Christ and his church cannot be ignored. Participate in countless prayers, developing and bear your testimony several times during the day, many hours of scripture study, meeting people home you would never meet if you stayed home, and indescribable experiences. The same level of experience is reserved for the youth whom the Lord calls to serve on service missions. You are very welcome and necessary. Please do not minimize the importance of a service mission, for service missions also provide indescribable experience. The worth of a soul is great in the sight of God, including the worth of your soul. Upon returning from your service, perhaps your girlfriend or boyfriend is no longer waiting for you, but you, you have learned very well how to make effective contacts. <laughs> your academic study will make more sense with the glimpses you have had about preparing more adequately for the workplace. And finally, you have the full certainty of having courageously proclaimed the gospel of peace testifying about the restored truth. For those of you who are married and in dif at different stages of your life, you are very necessary in the work of the Lord. Prepare yourselves, live healthy lives, seeking for temporal and spiritual self-reliance, because the opportunities to do what the Lord would do for his children are not limited to one age group. The most delightful experience my wife and I had, have had in recent years have come while you serve alongside special couples in special places and serving very special people. The experience I had at the end of my topography degree taught me that we always defend the truth when we proclaim it, and the defend, the defend, that defender of the truth is a proactive thing. The defense of the truth should never be done in a, an aggressive manner, but rather with genuine interest to love, share, and invite the people we are testifying to about the truth, thinking only about the temporal and spiritual welfare of the children of a loving Heavenly Father. In, gen in General Conference of October 2021, President Russell M. Nelson, our beloved prophet, taught, contrary to what some think, there really is what we call right and wrong. There really does exist an absolute truth, an eternal truth. The Holy Scripture teaches, teaches truth is knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. The knowledge of the truth does not make us better than other people, but it teaches us what we must do to return to God's presence. As you proceed firmly in Christ and with courage not only to proclaim the truth, but to live the truth, you will find comfort and peace during the turbulence that we will show encounter in these days. The challenges of life can knock us down, but know that when we exercise faith in Jesus Christ, our afflictions shall be but a small moment in the grand scope of eternity. Please do not create a deadline for the end of your difficulties and challenges. Trust in Heavenly Father and do not give up, for if we do give up, we will never know 
how the end of our journey would have been in the kingdom of God. Hold on to the truth, learning from the source of the truth, the scriptures, the words of the prophets, the Holy Ghost. I bear my testimony of Jesus Christ and that this is his church. We have a living prophet and we will always feel free when we proclaim the truth with courage. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. My dear brothers and sisters, this evening I speak to the humble and devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I see the goodness of your lives and your faith in our Savior here in this country and in the nations across the world, and I love you all the more. Toward the end of his ministry, Jesus' disciples asked him to tell them of the sign of his second coming and of the end of the world. Jesus told them of the conditions that would precede his return and concluded by declaring, when ye shall see all these things, you will know that the time is near. In the last general conference, I listened very closely to the words of President Henry B. Eyring. Each of us, he said, wherever we are, knows that we live in increasingly perilous times. Anyone with eyes to see the signs of the times and ears to hear the words of the prophets knows that is true. The Savior commended his valiant disciples, blessed are your eyes for they see, and blessed are your ears for they hear. May this blessing be ours as we listen closely to the words of the Lord through his prophets and others in this conference. The Lord explained that in this final time prior to his return, the wheat, who he described as the children of the kingdom, would grow side by side with the tares or those who do not love God and do not keep his commandments. They would both grow together side by side. This will be our world until the Savior returns, with much that is good and much that is evil on every side. You may at times not feel like a strong, mature stri strand of wheat. Be patient with yourself. The Lord said that the wheat would include tender blades springing up. We are all His Latter-day Saints, and although not yet all we want to be, we are serious in our desire to be His true disciples. We realize that as evil increases in the world, our spiritual survival and the spiritual survival of those we love will require that we more fully nurture, fortify, and strengthen the roots of our faith in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul counseled us to be rooted, grounded, and settled in our love for the Savior and our determination to follow Him. Today and the days ahead require more focused and concentrated effort guarding against diversions and carelessness. But even with the increasing worldly influences around us, we need not fear. The Lord will never desert His covenant people. There is a compensatory power of spiritual gifts and divine direction for the righteous. This added blessing of spiritual power, however, does not settle upon us just because we are a part of this generation. It comes as we strengthen our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and keep His commandments as we come to know Him and love Him. This is life eternal, Jesus prayed, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. As we know very well, having faith in Jesus Christ and bringing, being a true disciple is more than a one-time decision, more than a one-time event. It is a sacred, ongoing process that grows and expands through the seasons of our lives, continuing until we kneel at His feet. 
with the wheat growing amidst the tares in the world, how can we deepen and strengthen our commitment to the Savior in the days ahead? Here are three thoughts. First, we can immerse ourselves more completely into Jesus' life, His teachings, His majesty, His power, and His atoning sacrifice. The Savior said, Look unto me in every thought. The Apostle John reminds us we love Him because He first loved us. As we better experience His love, we love Him even more and very naturally better follow His example of loving and caring for those around us. With every righteous movement toward Him, we see Him more clearly, we adore Him, and we try in our small ways to emulate Him. Next, as we better know and love the Savior, we desire even more to promise Him our allegiance and trust. We make covenants with Him. We begin with our promises of baptism, and we confirm these promises in others as we repent daily, ask for forgiveness, and eagerly anticipate receiving the sacrament each week. We pledge to always remember Him and keep His commandments. When we are ready, we embrace the ordinances and covenants of the temple. Feeling the influence of eternity in our sacred, quiet moments in the house of the Lord, we gladly make covenants with God and strengthen our resolve to keep them. Making and keeping covenants allows the love of the Savior to sink more deeply into our heart. In this month's Liahona, President Russell M. Nelson said, Our covenants will lead us closer and closer to Him. God will not abandon His relationship with those who have forged such a bond with Him. And as President Nelson said so beautifully this morning, with the dedication of each new temple, additional godly power comes into the world to strengthen us and counteracts the intensifying efforts of the adversary. Can you see why the Lord would direct His prophet to bring the holy temples closer to us and allow us to be in His house more often? As we enter the temple, we are freed for a time from the worldly influences crowding against us. As we learn of our purpose in life and the eternal gifts offered us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Finally, my third thought, in this sacred quest, we treasure, protect, defend, and safeguard the gift of the Holy Ghost. Both President Ballard earlier and Elder Pearson just moments ago spoke of President Nelson's prophetic warning that I will repeat again. It will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. It's a gift beyond price. We do our very best to protect our daily experiences so the influence of the Holy Ghost remains with us. We are a light to the world, and when necessary, we willingly choose to be different from others. President Dallin H. Oaks recently asked young adults, Do you dare to be different? Especially important are the choices you are making in your personal life. Are you going forward against the world's opposition? In a recent social media post, I asked fellow disciples to share choices they had made that required them to be different from the world. I received hundreds of responses. Here are just a few. Amanda, I am a nurse working in the local jail. I try caring for inmates as Christ would. Rachel, I am an opera singer, and it's often taken for granted that I will wear whatever costume I'm given, regardless of modesty. 
because I am endowed, I told the producers that the costume would need to be modest. They were unhappy, but reluctantly made the alterations. I wouldn't trade the peace that comes from standing as a witness of Christ at all times. Chris, I'm an alcoholic in recovery, temple-worthy member of the church. I'm not quiet about my experiences with addiction and gaining a testimony of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Lauren, I was writing a skit with my classmates in high school. They wanted to have my quiet, reserved character have a sudden outburst of profanity. They kept pressuring me, but I refused and held my ground. Adam, a lot of people do not believe me when I say I keep the law of chastity and choose to abstain from pornography. They don't understand the advantage of joy and peace of mind it gives me. Ella, my father is a member of the LGBTQ community. I always try to keep other people's feelings in consideration while standing as a witness of Christ and being true to what I believe. Andraji, I decided to continue to go to church when my family decided not to go anymore. And finally, from Sherry, we were attending an event at the governor's mansion. They began handing out champagne for a toast. I insisted on water, although the staff said it would be offensive. We toasted the governor, and I held my water glass high. The governor was not offended. <laughs> President Nelson said, yes, you are living in the world but you have very different standards from the world to help you avoid the stain of the world. Anastasia, a young mother in Ukraine, was in the hospital having just given birth to a baby boy as the bombings began in Kyiv this past February. A nurse opened the hospital room door and said with an urgent voice, take your baby, wrap him in a blanket, and go into the hall now. Later, Anastasia commented, I never imagined my first days of motherhood would be so difficult, but I am focusing on the blessings and miracles I have seen. Right now, it might seem impossible to ever forgive those who have caused so much destruction and harm, but as a disciple of Christ, I have faith that I will be able to forgive. I don't know all that will happen in the future, but I know that keeping our covenants will allow the Spirit to be with us continually, allowing us to feel joy and hope even during difficult times. My brothers and sisters, I have been blessed to abundantly receive the love of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. I know he lives and guides this holy work. I do not fully have the words to express my love for him. We are all children of the covenant, stretching across the earth in nations and cultures on every continent, numbering in the millions as we await the glorious return of our Lord and Savior. Shining as a light to those around us, we consciously shape our desires, thoughts, choices, and actions, seeking with all our heart to know and love the Savior. We separate ourselves from the world through covenants with God, being distinct, uncommon, and special as we honor Him and His teachings without isolating ourselves from others who believe differently. It is a wondrous journey to be wheat among the tares, sometimes fraught with heartache, but always calmed by the maturing and assuring settling of our faith. As you allow your love for the Savior and His love for you to sink deep into your heart, 
I promise you added confidence, peace, and joy in meeting the challenges of your life. And the Savior promises us, I will gather together my people according to the parable of the wheat and the tares, that the wheat may be secured in the garners to possess eternal life and be crowned with celestial glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, our hearts are full at the end of this session with love for Thee and for Thy Son. 
We are grateful for this sacred space in which we have gathered to hear testimonies of thee and thy son and thy gospel. We're thankful for sacred spaces all over the earth where thy children have gathered to hear these testimonies. We're thankful for the testimonies of this choir of young people. We pray that each of them, the truths they have sung, may sink deep in their hearts and stay with them throughout their lives. May each of us also receive the blessings of revelation. And as we return to our homes, may those messages that have been imprinted on our hearts through the matchless gift of the Holy Ghost stay with us and bring us closer to Thee. We thank Thee for our living prophet, for the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve. We would ask Thee to bless them and each of us. We say this humbly and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Saturday evening session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by a choir comprised of children and youth who reside in the South Jordan, Utah area. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>